is Russia devoting its very limited air assets to stry- trying to stop the Ukrainians in Kherson? But are they still trying to push in Avdivka? Is anyone achieving anything on the battlefield anymore? I'm Paul, U.S. Army combat veteran. It's November 13th, 2023. This is your daily Ukraine update. Let's get into it. Okay, first taking a look at the control map and the two biggest changes and cha- calling them changes is a little generous in terms of control is one outside of Avdivka in the northern prong near Krasnohorivka, you can see Russian forces expanding their area of attack or the contested zone to include uh, this two windbreaks here and a little bit of this turf uh, on the road or the rail line to this Novo Bakhmutivka. And again, I point out that this is not actually constraining or tightening the news on Avdivka. And so it's not clear that even if they do advance into this basically no man's land, that it's going to result in any kind of real substantive achievement. Um, again, not to say that you have to advance straight towards your objective, but you do have to advance towards your objective somewhat. Um, And it doesn't look like the Russian forces are able to do that. Again, this isn't, we can't sit get too much in judgment because Ukrainian forces have had similar issues uh, during their counteroffensive. Uh, but the takeaway is again that Russian forces are continually grinding out, uh, throwing troops into Avdivka for unclear uh, actual battlefield effect. The other place where we're seeing some limited gains is near the town of Yag- Yagidne. Um, this is, of course, north of Bakhmut, and you can see where it's just listed again. No change to territory, but this area that was marked as liberated by Ukraine is actually now listed as contested. It indicates that Russian forces are pushing hard in this region. You can see it's pretty hilly, mountainous. Um, it's n- not a great sign because it, it if we remember, not too long ago, Ukrainian forces controlled up to and even a little perhaps beyond this Berkiva Reservoir. So the fact that Russian forces have advanced and they're starting to sort of roll back some Ukrainian gains to the, uh, at least to the north of Bakhmut, certainly there have been considerable Ukrainian gains to the south of Bakhmut. But this is a sign that, again, Russian forces really just fighting back and forth over the same limited terrain. And again, we're not actually seeing Russian forces advance. We're just seeing them make more area contested. Uh, When we go over to the combat map, this is what I thought was interesting. First off, you can see Russian forces uh, launching 61 combat engagements. That's actually pretty high. A notable concentration in the Kupiansk region, uh, which could indicate simply a greater volume. Uh, Russia may be trying to make some advances here in the north. Uh, They may be slowly coming to the realization that they're not going to break through in Avdivka. And as we talk about, the north is, is one of those zones where lighter troop concentrations in larger areas are more likely to allow for big sweeping gains. But the terrain really doesn't favor it. And you can see here, this is flat, open terrain, very little cover, not anywhere you'd want to try to launch a major offensive effort because you're going to telegraph it, right? Ukrainian drones, Ukrainian observers are going to see this well in advance. They're going to be able to deliver accurate fire. Um, even thin concentrations of ill-prepared troops are still able to slow offensive actions enough that reinforcements can be deployed and the lines can stabilize. So... I'm not optimistic for Russia's ability, or rather pessimistic, I guess, for, uh, I'm not pessimistic on Ukraine's ability to defend its its territory from Russian uh, attack attempts, especially given the fact that, remember, Avdivka was very, Russia spent a lot of time preparing for it, and they still sort of fumbled the bag. So an ill-prepared, hastily assembled of offensive action, I wouldn't even worry about it. Um, now, what I thought was interesting is that outside of Bereslav, Russian aviation assets have actually been directing and launching strikes on the area. As you may know, this is looks like another major crossing point um, in uh, Ukrainian forces already notably conducting operations across this Antonovsky bridge, contesting some villages like Oleski, um, Pristianivka, Pidstapone, Poima. Uh, so there's some villages that are 
now listed as as at least contested uh, and held partially by Ukrainian forces. And so I think the Russians really have a fear that Ukrainians may attempt to cross and open a second bridgehead and then link their troops up. Um, so uh, they may also simply be targeting logistics efforts. Uh, there's undoubtedly logistics bringing uh, troops and material from the Zaporizhia offensive areas where there's uh, a lot probably still from the counteroffensive. Uh, they're probably trying to divert it towards this region and, and Russian aircraft are probably on a mission to interdict it. But the fact that Russia has not a lot of combat aircraft it can fly Fly, and that it's devoting that limited combat air power into this action is itself pretty telling about Russia's Russia's desire to blunt Ukrainian efforts. Now, if you guys haven't been under a rock, you've heard of Strike Gum. Strike Gum is my company. It's an energy drink alternative. Um, I worked right with a manufacturer in Denver, USA, uh, to produce a energy drink alternative. Um, I actually saw somebody in the comments who actually went and checked a Red Bull to see if I was full of crap. And they found that, no, indeed, Red Bull has 90 milligrams of caffeine, but just one piece of Strike Gum has 90 uh, so we're already sporting 10 more milligrams than your Red Bull in just every single piece. And unlike uh, leading energy drinks, which are like, you know, five, four or five bucks a pop, uh, an entire pack, five pieces is going to run you just five or six ninety nine. Wait, six ninety nine, five ninety nine, five ninety nine. Oh, man, I don't even know my own prices. Uh you know, so you're talking about, uh, what a fifth, the price of an energy drink. So if you're interested, check us out at strikegum.com. 50% of the proceeds from this first production run are going to be donated to charities that support Ukrainian, uh, civilians who've been injured or displaced by the conflict. So check us out, strikegum.com support, uh, a great veteran owned company. And of course, uh, Ukrainians, uh, who could definitely use our help links in the description or up there. Okay, uh, what I thought was also interesting is that Russia, despite its military being basically ground into nothing, um, is still trying to market itself as a prominent security guarantor for authoritarian countries in Africa. And, you know, it's true, there are levels to the game. And while Wagner forces are getting crushed by uh, NATO-trained Ukrainian forces, um, Wagner forces are still very capable of fighting uh, ragtag militias and your typical African military or military-esque element. Um, and so Russia can actually still probably be an effective security guarantor or security partners, you know, sort of how the U.S. frames it, um, but for authoritarian countries. And there have been a lot. Uh, Russia has military agreements with 30 of the 54 African countries, um, so claims Russia, uh, right? The Generally, there's been a very public... Uh, alliance with Burkina Faso, Niger, Mali, and Libya, all authoritarian countries. Um, and Russian servicemen, of course, are actually supposedly uh, the uh, PSD, the personal security detail for President Ibrahim Taroe, uh, trying to stop him from future coup attempts, much like the one he used to seize power not long ago. So it's fascinating to me that despite being so hard pressed, the Russian Wagner forces or Russian forces are still out there trying to build international bridges. I, I suspect, I suspect that this partnership may come uh, later with a desire for military aged males to go to Russia and perhaps receive some military training and serve in the Russian military before returning home with some rubles in their pockets and uh, Russian loyalty and combat experience. I, I strongly suspect that's what those partnerships may end in. Anyway, guys, that's all I had for you. Thanks so much to the Colonel tier members of CombatVetNews.com, our Lieutenant tier members, and all the members of Combat Vet News. I couldn't do this without you guys. Thank you so much. And be sure to hit like and subscribe. See you in the next one. Cheers.